Happy Mon oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's try this again. Happy Wednesday. Wednesday. And, and welcome to our living room. Um, gathering of Friends, we're celebrating 100 years of journalism education at Ohio University. We've been blessed over the last day, two days, to have 17 of our alumni return from all parts of the United States to come and talk with our current students and have a reunion to talk about their careers, um, the different paths um, their careers have taken. And so my role is to thank you for coming, to welcome everyone who's here, and to give a special thanks to Pat and Smith Schooneman. The Schoonemans have been very generous in their, um, by making it possible for us to bring 17 alumni back to campus to share with us in this centennial symposium, a gathering of friends. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Hans Meyer, who just recently, all we need is the last stamp of approval from the Board of Trustees, but he has just been promoted to full professor. Congratulations, Dr. Meyer. Everything else is just a formality, um, so we're very proud of him. But I'll turn the, the session over to, to Hans and our guest, our reunion family. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. DeShiel. Um, happy for this opportunity. Great to catch up with these alumni again. Um, sad this is the last session, though. I wish I could have attended more. Um, but I was just talking to uh, Cedric and Claire back there. We're going to put these on our YouTube channel, so make sure you check them out later, okay? Um, I always have to geek out a little bit about streaming because that's kind of the world I'm in right now. So if you need a class for next semester, consider the broadcast cluster, all right? You can produce Athens Midday every day at noon. So Jack's in it, right? You in it? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, I don't want to take too much of our time because we have two awesome guests today. And... Um, this is kind of a little plug to, I asked my current class, my uh, podcasting survey students, to submit some questions for them. So I want to make sure I get to as many of their questions as I can, as well as leaving time for you. So, but let's introduce our guest first. Um, Heather Willard is our first guest there. Um, she is a public safety journalist in South Denver. Uh, she's with Newsbreak Originals Denver, when she, where she began in March 2022. She seeks to use new standards in public safety journalism to increase accountability from law enforcement agencies that have repeated officer-involved shootings or use of force, including a civilian. She spent her early career in newspapers where she large, largely focused on courts, crime, public safety, and the changing social justice landscape. Um, during Willard's tenure at the Athens Messenger, she served as interim editor for several months before accepting the role of assistant editor. In 2021, Willard began as a politics reporter for the Pueblo, Colorado Chieftain before changing beats to public safety. She was also elected the 2021 Pueblo News Guild Chair, a part of the Denver News Guild. Um, she studied in the Info News and Information track here at the EW Scripps School of Journalism, and she previously graduated with two associate degrees uh, summa cum laude from Cuyahoga Community College at the age of 17. And then Kyle Wiggers, um, he's a senior reporter at TechCrunch with a special interest in artificial intelligence. His writing has appeared in VentureBeat and Digital Trends, as well as a range of gadget blogs, including Android Police, um, Android Authority, Droid Life, and XDA Developers. Uh, Wiggers lives in Brooklyn, New York with his partner, a piano educator, and dabbles in piano himself occasionally, if mostly unsuccessfully. Appreciate the humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, my daughter's learning guitar, I'm trying to learn too, and it's, it's very unsuccessful at this point. So. I'm unforgiving. Yeah. But for some reason, I keep trying. <laughs> Maybe someday, we'll see. Thank yeah. You. Nope. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was just off the cuff, but I mean. <laughs> Yes, it's like a, we're journalists, you know, when we have the microphone, you can quote us. Once down, you can't quote yeah, I'm not, used to, I'm not used to being the subject of the story, so <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to ask them a lot of the questions about their experience here at o Ohio University and their work with their jobs, but, you know, they're both with startups. The title of this session is The Ones Who Never Unplug. So let's talk about, you know, working for a startup or covering a startup. You know, Kyle was just telling me TechCrunch isn't a startup, I guess, in the sense anymore, because it's owned by um, 
a venture capital firm, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yep. it started out as a very kind of tech startup. So um, tell me about like what it's working, what it's like working for a non-traditional company first. Yeah, so TechCrunch is different from any publication I've worked for before, I'd say. Um, uh, there's a lot of autonomy, and I think, um, you know, that's what it's known for. Like, it kind of lets it, uh, it trusts its reporters to, to do their job. And, you know, like, um, each person has an area of expertise, and they have, like, a roster of sources that they're familiar with and they go to um, for, for stories. So, um, typically, the reporting process for me is just brainstorming, um, you know, following the news religiously, um, getting ideas from, from the various feeds I, I have in my Feedly, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then going out and reporting it out, um, working with an editor if it's necessary, but often, like, I'll, I'll just publish something, it'll be back edited, and um, yeah, it's, 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 it's collaborative. I, I appreciate that, um, you know, that's the that startup atmosphere in the sense that, like, it's very open to experimentation, right? Um, new formats, different kinds of reporting um, than maybe your more traditional outlets. Um, but uh, yeah, to sum up, it, it's 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 different in, in the best possible way. I don't know how else to describe it. Like media startups are, um, yeah, I'm, uh, interesting. <laughs> like, struggling for the words, but. Oh, it's good, that's very good. Um, and then Heather, I mean, news break, um, is it's a national organization, but they're kind of just getting off the ground. They're trying to build sites in different communities. Uh, tell us what your experience has been like, you know, working for Newsbreak in, in the Denver area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Newsbreak started as a content aggregate app and they wanted to bring in some original content and they decided to start a pilot program in Denver, um, which was last March. And I was one of three journalists hired. Um, my editor is a Denver Post alum, and she will edit my stories. I get to choose anything I want to write within my beat, and rarely do I ever get her to say, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, and really, you just send it to her. She'll come back with some questions and some edits, and then I just move on. It's really fun. Awesome. Cool. Um, and so, you know, you're both talking about like the freedom that you have at a startup. So um, a lot of the questions that I got actually from my class were about some topics that you're both kind of passionate about and you cover a lot. Uh, you just heard in the last session that someone asked our last panelists about AI. Um, so let's ask Kyle. I mean, what do you think the future of AI is specifically in relation to journalism? Um, that is an incredibly broad and loaded question, I think. But um, I'll try to answer here as best I can. Um, so AI is in the news a lot, which I was talking to you backstage, like I'm not used to it. I've, I've covered AI since 2018 and back then nobody really cared about it. It's like, oh, this fun little thing that can generate some text, like maybe it'll go somewhere someday, but I, you know, nobody could think of applications for it really. Um, but now there are things like, you know, the chat bot that's built into Bing, um, where you can ask it questions and it'll give you roughly factual answers. Sometimes they're not so factual and sometimes they're biased and problematic and hateful, but <laughs> um, it's a work in progress. Um, so a couple of people have asked me uh, leading up to the session in the days that I've been here, um, like, can this be a reporting tool? Like, should journalists pay attention to this? And I think the answer is yeah. Um, there's the text generating part of it, um, you know, these chatbots like ChatGPT that can be useful research tools and maybe even like idea generators, um, pitch generators for that matter. Um, I played around with ChatGPT myself, not a ton, but, you know, just experiment with it and, and, and see if it leads to any stories. Um, and it, it does a reasonably good job with like first graphs of like not complicated stories. I think it could be a real time saver in some cases too, depending on the, on the nature of the reporting. Um, I would much rather use a tool uh, like that um, to save me time, you know, rewriting a press release than, than having to do it myself. And I, I feel like my time is probably better spent elsewhere most of the time, right? Um, and then I think like there's the image generation side of it too, um, which, you know, I have mixed feelings about, like I think some artists' jobs are, are probably in jeopardy. Um, or the nature of their jobs will change rather. Um, maybe they need to develop, you know, the skills, the skill sets around these tools that um, uh, currently, you know, are underdeveloped or underexplored. Uh, maybe artists need to learn how to like prompt these tools to generate particular kinds of art um, rather than doing it themselves. Um, could also save them time. Um, but like for a journalist working in digital media, like featured images are often important to our stories. Like they they draw people in. They they set the tone for the story. In fact, often. Um, so, like, I as a you know journalist have used generative AI tools to 
to create artwork that um, complements, you know, the, the text I've written. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's worked for, for some stories, others like, you know, the technology is not quite there. Um, and I worry about the implications um, we've seen in the news recently, like, uh, you know, the, the, the Pope wearing that ridiculous, like, puffer coat, like, created by AI, like, it went viral, and, like, people were, you know, they, they didn't, you know, they, they believed it was true, like, at least a portion of those who shared it on Twitter, like, didn't doubt this was a thing that happened, um, and that is horrifying, like, you follow that to its logical conclusion, and, you know, it's the end of the world. Um, <laughs> it's just, dis for, you know, disinformation run amok, um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I'm rambling, but the point is like there are pluses and minuses mm -hmm. to these technologies. I think reporters should be aware of them, um, use them so that they, they understand the dangers, but also the potential. Um, and yeah, not shy away from them. I think like banning them, like some school districts have done and colleges is not the right approach. Okay, very interesting. Um, and Heather, uh, we mentioned in your bio and a lot of students noticed that you know you've really seized on this idea of public safety and holding uh, law enforcement accountable. Um, Maddie from my class actually asked, "Was there a specific moment that led you to change your beat to public safety journalism? And if so, has that moment impacted the personal work you're doing today?" I think it's been a series of events that has slowly led me to want to be in the public safety realm. Um, it started with the Baker 70, if you remember that, when there were 70 students arrested in Baker Center for a sit-in. Um, I was like, wow, this really is impacting their lives for the rest of their lives. They were arrested, and now they've got that on their record. And I just seized on that, and I've never let go. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much to law enforcement that is secretive. And, and it has to be because you have to keep your community safe and you can't have, you know, the criminals knowing what the law enforcement is doing. However, they have so much power and they can do so much harm. And that is so important to make sure that there is someone holding their feet to the fire and they know someone's watching. <laughs> When you say they know someone's watching, I mean, have you seen that in your work? I mean, are they aware of what you're doing and mention it? Oh, yeah. I got an email a little while ago, actually. Um, the public information officer for the sheriff's office that I most often work with was extremely mad at me for a story I had posted on Twitter that I didn't write because the reporter had gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't my story. So I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go back to your time here then at Scripps. I mean, uh, what experiences did you have while you were a student here at Ohio University that helped prepare you for the jobs that you have right now? So let's start with Heather this time. <laughs> uh, going back to the Baker 70, um, that was a very long night of, I think it started at like 6 p.m. And I was, you know, writing and photographing and arguing with the Stadies about, hey, <laughs> what's going on until about like midnight, 1 a.m. And then I was in the newsroom writing it up. And um, then we followed it for the rest of the semester of what's going on. Um, are we doing anything to become a sanctuary city? All of that jazz. So um, that was very impactful for me in wanting to write more um, and then also one of the other things that helped me get into newspapers for a while was uh, writing about Numbers Fest, <laughs> RIP Numbers Fest. <laughs> um, yeah, and the students walking back and how they would shut down Route 50 and that kind of thing to talk about safety. Um, I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I actually drive by that location on my way home every day and they're out there moving dirt. I don't know what's going on, but you know, because, yeah, they, they don't have the concerts anymore, but I wonder if somebody's bought it and trying again, or maybe they're just building housing out there. Who knows? But. Numbers 2024? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Is nobody reporting on this? <laughs> I, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'm a bad journalist. I should report on it, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, to answer the question, though, um, so it wasn't within uh, the Scripps School necessarily, but um, one of the formative experiences I had here as a journalism student was... Um, so AVW Productions is still around, obviously, but um, Tech Heads is not, as far as I know. It was um, 
a blog within ABW Productions um, that was tech focused, no surprise. Um, but uh, it covered a bit of everything. Um, it was, you know, game reviews, video game reviews, movie reviews, um, a little bit of pop culture, a little bit of like recent tech developments, gadget reviews. Um, yeah, it was it was a fascinating mix and kind of like um, a good introduction to what tech media more or less is. I think it's moved away a little bit from like gadget reviews um, to um, to policy ethical coverage um, as you know like the gadget blogs I used to work for they still exist but they're not getting the traffic they once did like I, I don't think consumer tech is as shiny and new as it used to be or, or that exciting but yeah tech heads was um, I, I was editor for a while I was fortunate enough to um, to edit uh, the pieces that went up there um, and uh, it was the editing experience in particular was was really valuable. Um, just like understanding how to have that dialogue with a reporter, um, giving feedback in like a Google Doc, um, and uh, you know pointing out like ideas they might have missed or hadn't considered in their in their reporting their coverage of something. Um, and I carried that on to like my first editing job uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. um, it was at a at a site called XDA Developers, which is like smartphone and gadget focused for the most part. They have like a big forum. Um, where people like talk about this stuff, but they also have a news operation. So I was a news editor there, um, and I, I carried the lessons from you know my undergrad to there. Like I was having the same conversations over Slack and not um, whatever we were using, uh, you know, back in the tech heads days, um, Facebook Messenger or something. I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, and you know, it's a shame it's gone. But I have fond memories. You can find it on the Wayback Machine or something. Um, I'm sure there are remnants of it, but. Um, yeah, it was a great chance to just like go out and do journalism that we all thought was interesting. Everyone who was a you know a part of this back then. So thinking about that experience too, and even what you do now, I mean, what do you say to people who say, "Oh, tech"? I mean, that's just gadgets and just frivolous things. I mean, why why cover tech so much? Yeah, I think tech affects all of us, right? Um, I mean, the microphone I'm holding in my hand is tech, technically. <laughs> um, but we all carry smartphones too, you know, um, like those, they might not be that interesting anymore. Um, I, I don't follow the latest smartphones like I used to, like I used to be on top of that stuff, know all the specifications, like the resolution of the screen and, and all that. But, um, you know, they, like our lives are shaped by tech giants, um, like whether we like it or not. Um, it's, it's, you know, especially in the absence of like stronger regulation in the US, like, of things like AI and algorithms and transparency around those. Um, and uh, it's, it's really important to, to hold those companies accountable, um, given that they, um, they're shipping millions of devices that we're purchasing out of necessity, you know, more or less, like it's hard to operate in this world without a smartphone, a connected device. Um, so I, I think the accountability uh, part is, is the most important, right, when it comes to tech media, like, um, and I think it's the most exciting, you know, as a journalist personally, um, and, and feels more meaningful than gadget reviews, <laughs> all the gadget reviews I used to do. Um, and I think it's only, it's going to become more important as AI, like, becomes a bigger part of the conversation and, and again, begins to touch more of the, the work we do on a daily basis. Um, you know, like, even Twitter, you know, social media, that's algorithm driven. And like, it's important to know, like, what's going on behind the scenes, I think. Um, and uh, two, when there is wrongdoing, point that out, report it out, and um, you know, uh, hopefully affect some change. Mm -hmm. All right, so we talked about experiences while you were here at Ohio University and EW Scripps School of Journalism. What about specific classes? Was there a class that really stands out in your mind that helped you a lot? Do you want to start or? <laughs> uh, com Law with Dr. D. <laughs> I learned so much about my rights as a journalist, and I've used them. <laughs> I remember once I was uh, working for the Athens Messenger at the time, and I was taking photos of the bars uptown, and they were letting students in without masks on. That's news, especially when COVID had just hit. Um, somebody started a hate account on Twitter and like had my full name and my phone number and my email, and they tried to find my address. <laughs> it was wild. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is awful. <laughs> I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, but I knew I was in the right and they had no leg to stand on. So that's where that circles around. Yeah, that, that, that's the most important 
like you, you know, you're right. So you went in the end, basically. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So for me, it was um, Dr. Elizabeth Hendrickson's uh, feature writing class, magazine feature writing class. I believe she left to do something important. But um, yeah, I, it was a nice opportunity. Um, it was a great opportunity to. Um, you know, try my hand at feature writing, which I hadn't done a lot of prior to that class. Um, and that involves interviewing like multiple sources and piecing together a narrative that's hopefully interesting and, um, you know, has a larger point. So like I, I covered everything from like connectivity issue, issues in southeastern Ohio, right? Like a lack of like high speed bandwidth here um, relative to other parts of the state and other states for sure um, to like, um, you know, the process by which like honey is produced <laughs> um which there's a lot of, of of stuff i didn't know about that um prior to reporting that out but um anyway uh it was it was a great chance to just like you know be thrown a, a range of different things different subject matter and like try to become an expert at that well i mean not become an expert i think like it behooves reporters to realize that they're not i mean I, you know like i cover ai a lot but i i realize i, I only know you know, uh, as much as I've covered in the past, and I'm no like data scientist, um, I, I ultimately have to defer to people who, who you know, study this academically and, and for a living. Um, and the same goes for like any any subject matter, I guess you, you cover as a reporter, like um, you have to realize you're not like, uh, you have to listen to the experts and, 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 and realize that there's always more you could learn. But um, to get back to uh, the question, um, it was a chance to, to be in a newsroom where like um, we were all generalist generalist reporters um, and I, I don't know if that's so common anymore, I feel like. Um, more often than not like uh, reporters are going into niches and becoming experts in particular areas that's been my experience in tech, at least um, like at TechCrunch, there is no really general generalist reporter like people have their areas like I described at the at the top of this panel um, but. Um, when you're starting out in the field um, being a generalist is marketable <laughs> um you know being able to to write to a range of sub subject matter definitely you know helps in your interviews um so yeah i, I think that i, I take away I, I took away a lot from that class and it, it, you know i think about it to this day awesome great thank you Those good things um you know that kind of gives me it makes me uh, your answer makes me think of a question though you know what do you see journalists roles as now in the society that we live in especially in relation to tech and and you know everything that's happening right now um, well, you mentioned tech, so I feel like I have to, <laughs> I have to respond first. Um, you call me out. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think accountability, you know, just, just shining a light on bad actors um, is, is what we do best in tech media, I hope at least. I mean, we don't always get it right. Um, um, and I'm, you know, speaking for myself as well as like my colleagues, but I hope they agree with me. Um, uh, so I've written a couple of investigative stories that, um, exposed really awful behavior by CEOs like you know they weren't paying their employees or vendors um, and yet this company uh, their company raised you know countless tens of millions in venture capital um, above board it looked good but you peel back the surface and there's like a lot of rot in the foundation um, and uh, if it weren't for tech media like I don't know how else the information would get out there I mean like people might like former employees would post on Twitter about it, I'm sure. But I think we we amplify it, right? Um, a platform like TechCrunch has a big readership. So um, when we're when we write about it um, and and give a voice to these people, like um, hopefully something happens. Um, I can I can say from you know my experience is that that definitely it's it's affected some change. The you know the 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 bad actors have have been under fire and um, had to respond publicly and um get lawyers involved usually um so yeah i think that's the most valuable thing uh, we can do in tech media and um i i think like there, it's never been a better time honestly to to get into tech media um there's so much good reporting happening at vice wired um especially in ai um i think all those publications have amped up their coverage in that area they realize you know it's going to become more important to cover in the future um as it affects our lives increasingly um but uh yeah, it's it's a wild ride. There's always something new on the horizon to cover, and and has a million you know implications, good and bad. Um, but um, you know, it, it keeps it interesting, exciting. Yeah. I think Heather. I mean, maybe you could say the same about public safety. Is it you're looking for bad actors? Would you say? Or? 
Uh, looking for bad actors in the law enforcement side and uh, amplifying victims' voices on the court side. Um, often what helps get cases through to a trial is making those stories heard. Um, I mean, if there's a hit and run by a drunk driver, then that might be pled out. But if it gets in the media, they could get actual justice. So that's where I think um, most of my impact is. That's a, that's a strong impact, thank you. Um, so going back to your time here at OU, uh, was there one experience that really stands out in your mind and what was that experience? You know, beyond classes, beyond you know, student organizations, things like that. Or maybe a student organization was part of that. Oh, yeah. Just one? <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Um, I feel like all of my time spent in the new political newsroom was invaluable. Um, even if I didn't have a story to write, I'd be in the newsroom asking, hey, does anyone need help with edits? Do you want second edits? Uh, do you need help with a lead? Like, I was just always there. And that was so helpful for me because I got to hear everybody else's voices and what they were learning and what they were struggling with or what they were excelling at. And that helped me in the same vein. Mm. Yeah, so um, I think I have to return to Tech Heads for, for my anecdote. Um, so uh, we did just a bunch of things. We, we had fun with it. Um, and one of those things was podcasting. So for a while, we had like a regular podcast. Um, and that gave me experience like writing up a podcast agenda. Like it was just stuff I hadn't even considered before, you know, or like new, I was just like kind of winging it, looking at examples online, templates, um, you know, trying to, uh, to, to, to edit, you know, like something that sounded reasonably good, you know, in a 30 minute format, like not always the easiest task. And um, it was a lot of work. So like the podcast didn't last for that long. But um, I've done podcasts, you know, subsequent to that, like professionally, and I'm glad I had some experience and, and knew a little bit of what I was doing, like, um, you know, was no expert, but I, I knew what to expect at least, and um, that definitely calmed the nerves, if nothing else. Um, and, you know, like it's helped in, in interviews too that I've done like um, with, uh, with radio uh, outlets and, and TV, like it is a useful skill, public speaking for sure. Um, you know, obviously in your daily life, but in situations like this, and just to, to be able to like succinctly answer a question and get your point across, like it sounds in theory pretty straightforward, but it's not ever. <laughs> um, it's it's amazing the amount of editing I do I would do on that Tech Heads podcast, just like dead air or like we go on some tangent that was completely irrelevant to the question, like like I've done today. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean, again, Tech Heads was just, you know, the best like way to just branch out and try a bunch of different things. And like, I wouldn't, you know, the few years that I was in it had the privilege to be in it. Um, I wouldn't take that away for anything. That's great. That's great. All right. Uh, shifting gears a little bit before we get to questions from the audience. I have to say the panel is called the ones who never unplug. Is this true for you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> I've been getting my Twitter updates from the Douglas County Sheriff, from Arapaho Sheriff, Denver. I know what the snow is doing right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, shut my laptop since like 6 this morning, mm -hmm. 6.30, something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> so do you have any advice for students going into this field, especially in you know a tech-related field, about how to manage that? I mean, how to have a life but still stay on top of the news? Uh, like somebody said earlier in an earlier panel, I think it was Michelle, have non-negotiables. Um, my non-negotiables are lunch, I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'm not going to be able to think. <laughs> um, and also at 8 p.m. sometimes, if I'm being on time, uh, I try to turn off my notifications. Um, and I'll just go in and turn off all notifications on my phone. Just I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I think burnout is so real. Um, like I, I've seen colleagues, you know, succumb to it um, just because they've, you know, they, they've gotten too, 
too deep in, in, in what they're doing. Like um, they've risen to like editor positions in some cases and completely left the industry. Like they just can't handle the barrage of news, like the massive amount of work they have to do on a daily basis, like editing pieces, also writing them. Like, so I think it, you know, there's, there's this realization that's happening in the industry beyond just tech media that um, like that's not sustainable and it's good to see um you know I'm, I'm fortunate to have like supportive colleagues at TechCrunch that are like yeah you know you shouldn't work past six or seven at night and you know you can you can turn off the work email like you can answer those messages the next day you know uh sometimes there are breaking news situations um and you don't have a choice you're working through the weekend um and late nights but um when those aren't happening like you should take advantage and realize that it's a gift and there's nothing wrong with um, putting in your eight or nine hours and, and enjoying life. There's much more to, to life than work, which was a hard lesson for me to learn, frankly. Um, my first job in journalism at Digital Trends out of school, like I was the last to leave the office, um, just fell into those stereotypical, you know, uh, bright eyed, bushy tailed um, journalist patterns. Um, and uh, I look back on those years and like it got me to where I am now. So I guess I, I'm, you know, it, it, it had to happen, but also like it was kind of unfortunate, you know, I, I, I missed out. I did miss out on life um, in a in a new city I, I hadn't lived in before New York City. Um, so trying to make up for it now. But um, yeah, if I had to, to say one thing to to young journalists here or like, you know, undergrads who are soon going to enter the field, it's like, you know, keep everything in balance. Um, it's really exciting when you get your first journalism job out of college, especially I remember. But um, don't let employers take advantage of you um, and set boundaries, set limits. Uh, one question from the students that I want to get to, uh, specifically for Heather, is that, you know, we mentioned in your bio that you attended uh, Cuyahoga Community College before. Um, and a couple of students in my class asked about that. What was that experience like? Would you recommend that before college or before university? Or? Well, it definitely made it cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I started my college classes when I was 14 because I was homeschooled um, and I just was done with everything. So I started at community college. I wouldn't start that young. <laughs> All of my classmates were, you know, not necessarily college age students because it's community college. Um, but I had a lot of people take me under their wing and I learned a lot about life that I hadn't learned about before. And I had an English class my first semester there um, with Professor David Long. And he wanted us to get primary sources. He didn't want us to just read the books and write essays. He wanted us to talk to people. That was so cool. <laughs> and I was like, this is so much cooler than all of my creative writing classes or anything like that. I wanna do more of this. So I started writing for, there was a guy down the street that ran a community newspaper. So I wrote for him like three times. And then I decided I wanted to go to OU and transfer it in and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a last question before we open it up to the audience. Just give these students and just anyone here, you know, the best advice you have before starting in a career in journalism. You first. <laughs> best advice um make sure that you love it because there's going to be times where it's very hard there's days where you are over the moon things are the best they will ever be and there are days where you feel like you have never written a good sentence in your life <laughs> you've never taken a good photo and why am i here there's award-winning journalists all around me. How, who am I? Imposter syndrome is so real. But you've earned your place to be there. And especially if you're passionate about the subject, you will always stay. Yeah, um, so, I mean, uh, basically what she said, but um, <laughs> I'll try to add a little bit. Um, yeah, I feel like I feel I followed kind of an unconventional path. Like um, a lot of my early journalism jobs were freelancing for gadget blogs, and I kind of just reached out to them cold, you know, and, and was like, "Can I write for you?" Like I followed your site for years, and you know, I would love to contribute. And um, miraculously, 
most of them said, sure, why not? Like, you can write a few hundred words for us and we'll pay you for it too, which was awesome. As an undergrad, I was like, what? <laughs> I could do this and make somewhat of a living? Wow, awesome. Um, would have done it for free back then, but thank goodness they insisted. I know, I know. Um, but um, there, so like, I feel like, you know, there have been stepping stones in my career and then there have been detours that I didn't expect. Like I've, uh, you know, my first job out of college, um, I lost it at one point and was like just scrambling to make ends meet in New York. Rent was not cheap. Um, and I didn't want to have to move back to Ohio with my parents. Like <laughs> that would kind of suck. Um, my parents are great people though. Um, anyway, uh, so I had to take like an SEO optimization editing job at a parenting magazine digital magazine, fatherly. We've all um, had magazine jobs we didn't like. Yeah, I, I, I know. I for RV News. RV business to business <laughs> is not my jam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm more relevant during the pandemic maybe, but. <laughs> it was booming. <laughs> yeah, probably the, the ad space was at a premium, but um, yeah, uh, it wasn't, I can't say I was thrilled about the job or was that exciting even. I mean, I took away some skills from it for sure. O SEO optimization is a pretty big deal um, in journalism as it turns out. Um, not something that was impressed upon me necessarily as an undergrad here, I don't. I think it was a little before that whole trend of optimizing your articles so that they rank higher in Google search and it's kind of businessy and analytics focused. But um, yeah, like I questioned my path at that point. It's like journalism is really hard. It's hard to find good paying jobs in it, especially in tech media, which tends to be like competitive. Um, you know, everyone's like clamoring for those few well paying jobs. Um, but if you stick with it long enough, um, things do tend to fall into place, I will say, like on a positive note. Um, I, I was ready to take a full time job at Fatherly doing something that I, I wasn't super passionate about and like writing about gadgets on the side. But then I found my next full time, tech, uh, you know, tech journalism job is just by cold uh, emails mainly, just reaching out to publications that I admire and, you know, giving them, putting my portfolio in front of them. So, um, yeah, just persistence is important. But again, like, don't kill yourself over a job too. Like, it's so, that's also important. Um, early on, you feel the need to grind. I definitely did. Um, and you have to, to some extent, I guess that's the expectation, unfortunately, um, of young journalists, and it shouldn't be, and hopefully that changes. But um, once you're more established, like, don't let life pass you by. Um, you know, you have to you have to enjoy it. You have to, you know, reap the benefits of the all the work you put in. All right. Very good advice from both of you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we will open it up to the audience then. If you have a question, just step up to the microphone in there in the middle uh, where Professor Young is. Are you gonna kick us off, Professor Young? Or? Yes, I'll be the warm up <laughs> act. Uh, Heather and I both grew up country kids, um, and she's moved to the big city. I haven't. But what's that transition like? Because a lot of our students come from small town Ohio, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they may be intimidated. So what, what strategies, advice can you offer about taking that next big jump geographically as well as professionally? It was super intimidating, um, not least of all because I had to rent an apartment before even seeing it because I needed a place to land. Um, it can be really overwhelming to have so many people around because I'm I'm used to Athens County, 30,000 people when there's no students and Denver is millions. Um, you have to be able to find a space in the city that makes you glow inside. Um, for me, it's going to the open spaces and I, there's a lake nearby called Josh's Lake and I go and sit at Josh's Lake and I read. That's how I get out of the city, even though it's in the city. Um, so just finding things that will spark that joy for you. And also budgeting, lots of budgeting. <laughs> yeah. Now you grew up here in Ohio, Kyle, too, and was going to New York your first experience? I mean, when you moved there for the first job? Yeah, yeah, the question wasn't addressed to me, but I think I can speak to it a little bit as well. Yeah, like I, I so I lived in Twinsburg most of my life, which is, you know, smallish suburb of Cleveland. Um, probably some are familiar with it. So um, there we go, there we go, Twinsburg Pride. <laughs> Home of the famous Twins Day. I love explaining that to people. Like um, often I wasn't around for it, but um, 
supposedly it happens. And go brings, Tigers. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Um, but yeah, like New York was wild. Um, it is overwhelming. Um, it was to me at least. Uh, yeah, renting an apartment on your own for the first time, like, um, you know, just dealing with the daily stress of like finding a laundromat and like making friends in a place where, you know, maybe you didn't have any, I didn't. Um, I mean, I had to Google the nearest subway because I didn't know anything. <laughs> Oh, I, I still do that, but I've lived, I've lived in New York six and a half years, and I, I usually don't know where I am. Like, it's landmarks for me, pretty much. Like, um, but um, and now, like, uh, all I can say is that I think it does get easier over time. Um, what helped me is pushing, pushing myself out of my comfort zone. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to, like, live life inside of your apartment anywhere, I think, and, like, shield yourself from the world and just be... Um, you know, be introverted um, and and sort of like closed off. Um, and I fell into that trap for a while. Um, Definitely. But eventually, you know, I found my outlets and interests and social groups. And like, I'm proud to say, like, some of my best friends are in New York now. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it it helps you grow as a person. You like, you know, it's it's scary. It was scary to me just going to my first like social outside of work meetup, like this random group I found on Reddit, thankfully it was safe, like nothing bad happened. <laughs> it's New York, so you never know. But um, like, take that risk, you know? And, and like some of them also have become, not sources per se, but they tip me off on some things. Like my software developer friends at Salesforce have been helpful lately. So <laughs> you never know how that might benefit your career as well. Like take chances, I guess is the, is the gist. Great, okay, thank you. Well, I should clarify, I'm actually from Bainbridge, not Twinsburg. Oh, I, close enough. Well, that's where I went to school, so. <laughs> oh, there you go. Anyway, so um, so my question is for both of you. Um, you're both very passionate, it appears, about like the stuff you cover. Um, and uh, so I kind of wonder, what, how do you guys select stories and how do you cover those stories? Do you have personal um, kind of uh, uh, like steps you take to make sure you're not getting too invested, too passionate, and kind of too biased towards uh, one side of the story or not? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I haven't thought about it like that. That's a really good question. Um, so when it comes to selecting stories, I try to be very broad in what I pick from misdemeanors to felony cases, because they're both crimes happening. Um, I try to be careful about what defendants I'm showcasing, um, because mugshots will follow you forever. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot half the question. <laughs> no, yeah, so I was just wondering if, if there's anything like, um, if you have any pre-planned out kind of steps you're saying like, okay, I need to make sure you know, I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm spreading my uh, uh, kind of net in a uh, wide yeah. enough, especially for you, because, um, you know, with uh, policing and stuff, I mean, you want to make sure they're not taking it too far, but then also, you know, you can, yeah, so typically, sorry if it's kind of a bad question. My approach is typically be critical of everything and um, watch your, your back end demographics and see if people are paying attention. If they aren't paying attention, you might not care. But for some stories, it's still important even if people don't care, like funding, nobody's going to click on it. It's so important. Yeah, that's that's not a bad question at all. I think it's a two part question, though. Um, and uh, I think I explained like how TechCrunch works poorly at the beginning. So I'll try again. Um, it, every newsroom is different, I guess. There are your more traditional newsrooms where, um, you know, you have an editor and they assign you stories and you go report them out and then your editor, you know, looks over them. Maybe there are several layers of editing, in fact, that happen. And then the story is put out into the world. Um, I've worked in newsrooms like that. TechCrunch is more like you go and report what you feel is important and everybody usually agrees. I've never, nobody's ever like killed a story of mine. Um, and like, if you want to work with an editor and fine tune it, you can, but you don't have to. Um, there's, there's just a lot of trust. Um, that I, I don't think I always would have been able to do that. Like earlier in my career, that would have been tough. Um, I, I wouldn't have known what stories to write about, frankly. Um, I think you only, you, you get to that level by having a beat. Um, and it might be several beats, but you get a good sense of like a field and you you have a good like bullshit detector, frankly. Um, 
you know, we as journalists get a lot of pitches, right, from from friendly PR reps or not so friendly sometimes, but um, and just companies um, that want to get their information out into the world, or um, I guess you could call like so, you know sometimes sources like pitch. By I mean, I have you a DM or... public information officers will send me a press release and say, "Run it as is." Officer involved <laughs> shooting. What's that mean? It means nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's there are expectations that are kind of out of whack sometimes from from those folks, but um, yeah. So. Um, and when you have when you develop a beat, you know when you've written about a topic for long enough, um, like off the bat, you you know this is crazy or like this is wrong or maybe this warrants further investigation. Like sometimes, like I hear about a crazy startup that's doing something that can't possibly be true, but like why not profile them and like use that as a lens to look at a wider issue or an industry? Um, as far as the second question is concerned. Um, uh, that that's an interesting uh topic to hit on because like i think journalists are putting themselves out there more these days than they used to and like developing brands and personas um and it's like taken you know getting used to for me like i'm not one to do that necessarily but you see like folks with newsletters and you know very popular just like independent blogs um that have a wide following and they've like splintered off from big media companies and um you know, become like business people essentially. Um, and, you know, they've done that by developing a voice and sort of like a bias, I guess, if you will, like you kind of know what you're getting from them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's a bad thing necessarily. It depends on the kind of journalism you, you do and, you know, where you work. Um, for me, I try to, when, when I, I, I do have a bias, like I, I think um, like surveillance is generally not the best business to go into like for a range of different reasons ethical legal what have you so when i hear about like a surveillance startup i'm like they're probably bad news like i don't care what the press release says like they're doing something shady um <laughs> but like you have to back that up right you can't just write that at least at a place like TechCrunch. i mean it's not an opinion uh publication for the most part we have op-eds but like it's not our bread and butter so but if you can speak to an ethicist who who you know is respected in their field and will say that you know verbatim and you can quote them then it's fine so you can feel a certain way about a topic as long as you i think back up those those feelings if you're able to like it's good it makes for a good story it's compelling to add on to that i feel like one of the things that i was told quite often in journalism school was you can't really have opinions out there um there are things that will always feel opinionated and you have to stick by them. Um, by and proud. And that might put me on the wrong side of some people, including the police. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'll ask the last question. Cyber trolling is real. Uh, in response to any type of news if somebody disagrees. So this is appropriate for both of you because if Kyle writes something about tech somebody doesn't like, you know, they know how to find out where you are. Um, and then for Heather, you're covering a predominantly male law enforcement institution in the country. Um, were there ever times that either of you felt like you weren't safe or secure? Um, you know, how did you handle those situations? Sure. Um, there's been a few situations where I didn't feel safe. Um, specifically, I went to, it was a rally in Pueblo County, Colorado on the same day as January 6th. And it was about supporting Trump and his alleged election win. And a number of people, when I showed up wearing my news press badge, they started waving their signs in my face, screaming like the media is fake, fake media, false news. And um, that was really hard to get around and actually get the story. So I um, I found a guy that was just sitting on the side of a sidewalk 
And I said, hey, you mind if I sit with you? And we ended up striking up a conversation. He let me interview after a while. So, but that was a very scary situation at first because I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any, like, I feel like I'm somewhat insulated um, being in tech media and write, and working remotely. <laughs> so I'm not often put in those scenarios. Um, I mean, just the other day, somebody did create a fake uh, Instagram of me, though, and they were saying, like, really offensive things. Fortunately, it was shut down quickly, but, like, that that's the experience I can speak to. Um, there are a lot of trolls out there, for sure, um, and they say hurtful, hateful things. Um, like, sadly, you know, you just have to develop a thick skin, I think, and realize that, like, these people are doing this for whatever reason, you know, like, maybe their mental health isn't great, like, um, but it's not gonna, they can't harm you. I mean, like, fortunately at TechCrunch, we've had like training on um, removing your personal information from the internet, like making it so that like somebody can't just pull up your address and, you know, swat you or something. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the job, I guess, sadly. Um, like moderation on these platforms is questionable at best sometimes. And um, all you can do is like report these accounts as they pop up. Um, I can't say I've ever felt like incredibly unsafe, um, you know, looking at the behavior of some of these accounts, but um, uh, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Sadly, like you just have to press on. I don't have a better answer. Yeah, I mean, I wish you did. It's sad that we live in a world where this happens, but you know, yeah, it's something that you have to kind of deal with. So, so good. All right, uh, I'm getting this signal that I got to wrap it up, but thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, I think we had a great, great discussion, great advice. Um, I love their talk about passion. We need more passionate journalists out there, so follow their lead. Uh, but let's give them a round of applause.